Welcome to NTD News Today. I'm Kevin Hogan. Let's take a look at our top stories. Candidates making a final push to rally voters ahead of the midterm elections next week. We take a look at some of the highlights. Pennsylvania might be a crucial in determining which party has control over the U.S. Senate next year. Candidates from both parties addressed voters in the Commonwealth last night. We bring you the highlights. A music legend joins former President Barack Obama on a Nevada stage to shore up support for a candidate in a pivotal midterm election contest. With the November 8th midterm elections rapidly nearing, hear what analysts are saying about the latest developments and scenarios. With less than a week before the midterm elections, candidates are getting out and rallying voters. NTD's Jessica Beatty gives us some of the highlights. Candidates across the U.S. were out rallying voters Tuesday. In Georgia, Democrat Stacey Abrams is challenging Republican Governor Brian Kemp. At a rally in Atlanta, she accused Kemp of banning things. He's banned the truth, and it's time for us to ban him from the governor's office. Kemp defeated Abrams in 2018 by less than 55,000 votes. They face off again next week. Over in Pennsylvania, Democrat Josh Shapiro rallied voters ahead of his bid for governor. He said he'll help build an economy that lifts everybody up. It starts by raising our minimum wage to $15 an hour. That makes sure we protect the Indian way of life here in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. So far, Shapiro is ahead of his Republican rival, Doug Mastriano. But Pennsylvania is a battleground state where presidential elections at least can go either way. In Ohio, U.S. Senate hopeful Democrat Tim Ryan spoke to union workers. Ryan said if he's elected, he'll work with both Democrats and Republicans. That's important for people to know. I'm an independent operator on behalf of working class people here in Steubenville. Ryan's cast himself as a voice for working class voters. He's facing Trump-endorsed Republican J.D. Vance, who wrote Hillbilly Elegy, It's about growing up in poverty in Ohio. In recent polls, Vance has taken a narrow lead. Down in Texas, Republican Governor Greg Abbott spoke to supporters in Fort Worth. He went after his Democratic challenger, Beto O'Rourke. Beto has supported the ideology of defunding the police. We do not need, as a governor in Texas, anyone who defund the police. We will beat Beto, and you will keep a governor who supports our law enforcement officers. Abbott also touted a strategy of sending illegal border crossers to blue states. Since April, Texas has bussed more than 7,000 illegal immigrants to Washington, D.C. and New York City. And in Michigan, a final push from Republican candidate for governor, Tudor Dixon, has helped her pull closer to incumbent Gretchen Whitmer. Dixon went silent after draining her resources in the primaries. But two primetime debates and help from the Republican Governors Association are making the race more competitive. This is the plan, and that's how it went, and I actually think that our momentum is coming at just the perfect time. The question is whether the late push will be enough for Dixon to overtake Whitmer. Jessica Beatty, NTD News. Staying on the midterms, both Pennsylvania Senate candidates campaigned last night. Republican candidate Mehmet Oz says Washington is too divided, and he's vowing to bring balance to D.C. Our reporter attended his speech. On Tuesday, Republican Senate candidate Mehmet Oz campaigned in Ben Salem, Pennsylvania. The race between him and Democratic Lieutenant Governor John Fetterman is crucial to Republican hopes of regaining control of a Senate now narrowly held by Democrats. At his speech, the doctor said he has the diagnosis to why Washington is getting it wrong. Washington's getting it wrong because of the extreme positions that they're accepting of. And they need a dose of Pennsylvania reality. I want to go to Washington and bring balance. He says what he calls partisan bickering has to end. Because when I travel around Pennsylvania, I don't hear people telling me to go beat up on Democrats. Heck, we're a purple state. Your neighbors are Democrats. And by the way, they're going to vote for us in this election. After the rally, we asked a Pennsylvania trade school owner what his main concerns are at this year's election. I'm in Philadelphia, so crime is first. Crime is before even uh, financial. You know, the next is the economy. The economy is very important right now, too. And then, you know, we have a high level of uh, fentanyl problems, which still leads back to crime, and it affects the economy. Fetterman also campaigned on Tuesday. He met with voters in Erie County. 
that we want to call to eliminating the filibuster. And uh, eliminating the filibuster was always critical because it's understood that if you want to have kind of the important kind of core issues that we believe, you know, not just Democrats, but I think a majority of Pennsylvanians all would like to see, you know, enacted. Fetterman has lost his initial lead and polls are now tight between him and Oz as concerns about rising inflation have taken a toll on Democrats ahead of the midterms. Speaking of the Keystone State, a major ruling from the Pennsylvania Supreme Court that could impact next week's midterm elections. The court ruled yesterday that local election boards cannot count any ballots mailed with undated or incorrectly dated envelopes. Several Republican groups, including the Republican National Committee, filed a lawsuit last month. They demanded the acting secretary of the Commonwealth uphold a state requirement for voters. The requirement compels voters to sign and date the outer envelope of their mail-in ballot when they return it. Prior to the latest legal fight, the Third U.S. Circuit Court of Appeals ruled in May that having dates on the return envelope is not mandatory. But the U.S. Supreme Court in October annulled the decision by the appeals court. So far, no reaction on the ruling from the Pennsylvania Secretary of Commonwealth's office. And over in Wisconsin, a ballot mystery at the home of Assemblywoman Janelle Branchin. The state lawmaker received three military mail-in ballots last week without applying for them. The envelopes were addressed to someone named Holly with three different surnames. None of them live or have ever lived at her address. Research suggests that these names might be made up. So far, it's still unknown who requested those ballots and directed them to be sent to Branchin. Wisconsin doesn't require voter registration for military personnel, so all it takes to get a military ballot is a fictitious name and date of birth. Branchant said the ballots point to the loopholes in this online application process. She called for more safeguards for military absentee voting. And top figures in the Democratic Party were out stumping yesterday. President Joe Biden, former President Barack Obama, and music artist John Legend came out in force to support midterm election candidates. Entity's Daniel Monahan has the story. And tonight, the reason why we're here is because we need to show up for our democracy. Is that right? Legend was on hand with Barack Obama at a Nevada early vote rally to bolster support for Senator Catherine Cortez Masto. The only way to make this economy fair is if we, all of us, fight for it. Masto is widely viewed as the most vulnerable Democrat in the U.S. Senate. Her race against former State Attorney General Adam Luxalt has been deadlocked for months. During his speech, Obama decried violent rhetoric in U.S. politics. You got politicians who, instead of wanting to bring people together, do their best to stir up division and make us angry and afraid of one another. Meanwhile, over in Florida, Biden took the stage in support of DeSantis' rival Charlie Crist and Senate candidate Val Demings. Well, Senator Rubio, I have a message for you. Rape is a crime. Incest is a crime. Abortion is not. After jogging sprightly across the stage, Biden took aim at Republicans. Folks, this ain't your father's Republican Party. This is a different breed of cat. President Biden then talked about how the economy was in ruins when he took office before admonishing the oil industry. Americans across the country have stepped up and are doing the right thing, but not everyone. The oil industry is not doing the right thing. Now over to Michigan, where Liz Cheney crossed the aisle to stump for Democratic Representative Alyssa Slotkin. She said it was her first time campaigning for a Democrat. And I have to tell you that it was not a hard decision at all. Cheney's visit to the battleground state comes as she considers a 2024 presidential run after losing her primary earlier this year. Daniel Monahan, NTD News. As polls continue to tighten ahead of the midterms, we take a look at what analysts say we can expect on November 8th. NTD's Daniel Monahan has this story. Former White House Press Secretary Jen Psaki says Democrats are worried that momentum has shifted towards Republicans. She says Democrats are encouraged to vote for candidates at the top of the ticket but lack enthusiasm for down-ballot races. In late September, Psaki said the party will lose if they are seen by the electorate as a referendum on the leadership of Biden. 
Republicans now consistently lead Democrats on the generic congressional ballot. That's a poll asking which party voters will support. Only two of the past 15 generic congressional ballot polls show a Democratic lead. Meanwhile, former President Barack Obama recently traveled to Georgia to attempt to bolster Senator Raphael Warnock and candidate for Governor Stacey Abrams. He has also campaigned in Michigan, Wisconsin, and Nevada. Kellyanne Conway said on Fox News that she sees desperation in the move. But I think the Obama question is a really important one. Vintage Obama was about hope and change, but now he's out on a recovery and rescue mission. She touted the poll surge of Lee Zeldin in the governor's race for New York and says people don't feel safe. And you have an entire Democratic Party telling the country, don't believe what you see, believe what I say. That's why voters are rejecting that. Former White House Press Secretary Ari Fleischer predicts a big Republican triumph. That's the thing about a wave election. You don't know it until you're soaked, you're under it, and then the other party is jubilant. That is the possibility a week from tomorrow. Despite such predictions of Republican landslides, one analyst says a closer look at the data shows that Democrats still have a chance if they can get out the vote. The Democrats are not doomed. It's not a foregone conclusion. And most of the analysis about how midterm elections play themselves out is incorrect and based upon a misunderstanding of the election data. He says a majority of voters in the United States support Democrats. The decisive issue, according to Phillips, is how motivated those voters are to go out and vote. Both parties have been campaigning on key topics that resonate with their members and attempts to galvanize their voters. In the wake of the Supreme Court's decision to overturn Roe v. Wade, states are seeing an uptick in young women registering to vote Democratic. Phillips says the court's decision may have triggered a backlash as some women rushed to secure voting rights. It's one thing to talk about Roe v. Wade and to be able to use it as a, um, you know, a, a, a alarm bell to your far right corner of your base. It's another thing for the Supreme Court to actually overturn it. Christina Latham of the University of Nevada, Reno, says it's important not to get overly excited that you're going to see high early voting turnout for Democrats. We do see higher numbers of early voting among the Democratic Party and more um, same day voting within the Republican Party. The Senate stands at 50-50 with Harris serving as a tiebreaker. In the House, Republicans need to gain a total of five seats. Daniel Monahan, NTD News. A change in congressional power could have a big impact on the economy and government spending, but little focus has been given to what it means for judges and how this could affect the lives of everyday Americans in terms of their freedom of belief. Joining us now to discuss religious freedom is Ryan Hulfenbein, the executive director of the Standing for Freedom Center. Pleasure speaking with you, Ryan. Hey, Kevin, thank you. There are currently around 80 federal judicial vacancies. Which party controls the Senate will determine how these vacancies are filled. How could this impact religious liberty in the United States? Well, I would say that it is hugely important that we have equal protection under the law. And that is a long-standing legal tradition in this country, going all the way back to the founders. The, re the reality is religious liberty, which is enshrined in our Constitution in the First Amendment, is protected. It is only as good as those men and women who are gaveling in. And what is their judicial philosophy? Will they be activists at the end of the day, or will they be those who uphold and affirm the Constitution in the United States they've been sworn in to defend and protect? And so the, the 80 vacancies, as you mentioned, uh, that's going to be hugely important. If there is a Republican majority in this confirmation process, it's not going to be a cakewalk to just get them through. Ryan, you mentioned the GOP. What is Mitch McConnell's role in this? Well, I mean, it, he is obviously the leader uh, of the party. Uh, he is the, the most ranking member of the Republican Party. Uh, he is he's a master, I would say, when it comes to uh, whipping the votes and, and being disciplined and calling to order uh, Republican vote. If there are two or three uh, Republican senators in that majority, Mitch McConnell will become the Senate Majority Leader once again, and uh, and certainly he will have the power, wield the power in the Senate uh, to bring the opposition uh, to the president. So I would say Mitch McConnell uh, certainly is going to be the leader when it comes to judicial appointments and bringing them through the process. Now, at the end of the day, uh, it, the appointments come from the president, 
Uh, but they are going to be vetted in the Senate. And the cross-examination, we'll be able to see those hearings and witness those testimonies and see exactly what these uh, judicial appointments actually believe at the end of the day. Well, we know the outcome of the midterms in less than a week. Now, let's talk about a recent win for religious liberty. The Washington High School football coach, Joseph Kennedy, was reinstated after the Supreme Court ruled the Constitution protects his private religious practice. How much of an impact will lower courts have over these types of issues? Oh, the lower courts are greatly consequential. Uh, when you consider uh, how many cases, especially on the issue of free speech and religious liberty, many of them are determined at the lower court level. Um, I, I think that the remaking of those courts uh, into being more less of an activist court, uh, there, I would say the Sixth Circuit's court was one that was remade under uh, President Trump. Uh, it, it, it now has a majority of conservative judges. And when we say conservative, we're not talking about Republican. We're just saying upholding and affirming the Constitution. Um, Coach Kennedy case and many others, there's 303 Creative, uh, which is the master cake shop there in uh, Colorado, has a, has a landmark case that's going to be determined by the court as well. Uh, and all of these cases are hugely important when it comes to the question of religious liberty and making sure that our freedoms are affirmed and upheld in this country. Whether you are a Christian or not, it doesn't matter, Jewish, Muslim, or even a secularist, it's important that we have an equal regard with respect to our conscience. Freedom of belief is definitely something this country is founded on. Ryan Helfenbein, the executive director of the Standing for Freedom Center, great speaking with you today. Thank you, Kevin. Coming up, two police officers are injured in New Jersey while trying to arrest a shooting suspect. The alleged criminal is still at large. We have that and more after this break. A gunman injured two police officers yesterday in New Jersey. The Newark mayor said the attack happened when police tried to arrest a suspect after receiving a 911 call. There was a brief altercation. The gentleman uh, pulled a gun out, uh, shot two police officers at close, close range. Uh, gunshot was returned, fire was returned. Uh, the gentleman retreated back into the building. Uh, we are uh, right now clearing the building out. All of the Mostly all of the residents have been cleared out of the building already. A caller reported finding the suspect from a previous shooting last Friday. Police then arrived at the building and confronted the attacker in a parking lot. He fired several shots at the officers. One of them was shot in the leg, the other in the shoulder. Both officers are now in the hospital, but in stable condition. A SWAT team has been sent to the building in a search for the gunner. He remains at large as of now. Police have identified the target and are hoping to arrest him tonight. CVS, Walgreens, and Walmart have tentatively agreed to pay at least $12 billion to settle opioid lawsuits. According to Bloomberg, the lawsuits were brought by state and local governments. They allege the retailers mishandled prescriptions of opioid painkillers. More than 3,000 lawsuits have been filed against pharmacies, opioid manufacturers, and distributors, accusing them of downplaying the addiction risks of opioids and also failing to stop the pills from being used illegally. Data shows the opioid crisis has claimed more than half a million lives over the past two decades, 80,000 of them in 2021 alone. Twitter has announced it will charge $8 a month for its blue service, which included its verified badge. New Twitter boss Elon Musk says the company seeks to boost subscriptions and make the social media network less reliant on ads. A blue check mark next to a person's username means Twitter has confirmed that the account belongs to the person or company claiming it. The existing blue service costs $5 a month. Musk's comments follow media reports that he was looking at the process of profile verification and how the blue check marks were given. Twitter used to give these to noteworthy profiles based on its own criteria. Musk on Tuesday said subscribers with blue check marks would get priority in replies, mentions, and searches. They would also be able to post longer videos and audios and only see half as many ads. A recent poll suggested that more than 80% of Twitter users said they would not pay for the check mark. Around 10% said they were willing to pay $5 a month. Twitter is currently free for most users. 
Musk reiterated Tuesday night that accounts suspended from the platform will not return right away. Musk tweeted, Twitter will not allow anyone who was deplatformed for violating Twitter rules back until we have a clear process for doing so. He added that the process could take weeks. That means users, including former President Donald Trump, likely will not be able to rejoin the social media site before the midterm elections. And Spotify is publicly lashing out at Apple over Apple's 30% fee on in-app transactions. Spotify refuses to pay the 30% fee and therefore can't sell audiobooks, a business it's trying to break into, inside its iOS app. The music streamer built three workarounds it thought were consistent with Apple's policies. All three were rejected after undergoing reviews for the App Store. So Spotify had to essentially abandon audiobook purchases in its iOS app. A lawyer for Spotify said the issue was, quote, reflective of Apple's anti-competitive practices across the board. Apple also says audiobooks via its pre-installed Apple Books. Apple says that Spotify's workaround broke its rules. The union representing United Airlines pilots have rejected a tentative agreement. 94% of members voted against the deal. United said it expected the rejection. It is already working with the union on a new agreement with improved rates and other enhancements. Just one day ago, Delta pilots voted in favor of authorizing a potential future strike. If that happens, it won't be until after the Thanksgiving travel surge. A multi-million dollar COVID-19 fraud scheme. Four people are now charged. The fraud case involves the CARES Act that Congress passed in 2020. It authorized more than $2 trillion in COVID-19 relief. The money included about $350 billion in loans for the Paycheck Protection Program, or PPP, to bail out small businesses amid the lockdowns. According to the U.S. Attorney's Office for the District of South Carolina, one of the four defendants allegedly created false PPP loan applications for up to 100 people nationwide. Altogether, the schemes could have stolen $2 million in federal funding. If convicted, each defendant could face a maximum 20 years in prison, along with fines. And in other news, a hospital in Atlanta has shuttered its doors after more than a century in operation. Atlanta Medical Center officially closed on Tuesday. It comes two weeks after the hospital shut down its emergency department. Wellstar ran the hospital. The company announced in August it was closing Atlanta Medical, blaming falling revenue and increased staff and supply costs. The closure leaves just one level one trauma center in Atlanta for victims of car crashes and other violence. And onto a cold case. The Las Vegas police believe they have the man behind a decades-old murder. 64-year-old Paul Nuttall has been charged in the 1980 killing of Sandra DeFelice. The 25-year-old was brutally raped and murdered inside her home. Nuttall was originally named as a person of interest in the case after authorities found his fingerprint in DeFelice's home. But it was explained away because he was a friend of her roommate. Then, last year, investigators used new technology to test DNA evidence recovered under DeFelice's fingernails, and it was Nuttall's DNA. He is now behind bars, charged with murder, sexual assault, and burglary. And just ahead, a U.S. charity reportedly hosts a secret Chinese police station in its New York headquarters. Now, a report says a campaign donor for New York City Mayor Eric Adams has ties to that charity. And British lawmakers have called for an investigation into unofficial Chinese police stations located within their borders. These overseas agencies are reportedly used to force dissidents back to China. Get the details in just a minute here on NTD News. As Americans, it seems like other people have been telling us what to do, how to live, and how to think. But that's not how we founded the greatest nation on Earth. During times of powerlessness, we found power. And we found power through taking action. Through action, we find solutions. And through solutions, we find freedom. The supply shortage has made it harder than ever to keep your shooting skills sharp at the range. 
Introducing Strikeman, a laser firearm training system that allows you to practice your shooting skills at home without wasting a dime on ammo. Using our laser cartridge, target, phone mount, and award-winning phone app, become a proficient shooter in under two weeks. Create training templates with firearm drills and get live feedback with progress tracking on your shot accuracy and shot times. Beat personal records and compete with friends and family to crown the best shooter in the group. Put the power back in your hands with Strikeman. Welcome back. New York City's mayor in the spotlight. A report says one of his election campaign donors has ties to a troubled U.S. charity, which reportedly hosts a secret Chinese police station in its New York headquarters. Here are the details. According to Daily Calder News, the president of the American Chong Li Association, James Liu, financially supported Mayor Eric Adams' election efforts. He donated $4,000 to Adams' mayoral campaign between 2019 and 2021. But Liu's nonprofit, the American Chong Li Association, was embroiled in a series of controversies earlier this month. That's amid reports that the group had been operating a Chinese police station inside its headquarters in Lower Manhattan. It's allegedly tasked with spying on Chinese nationals. The Manhattan police station is one of more than 100 law enforcement offices the CCP has set up worldwide. According to a human rights group, these stations also participate in intimidation, harassment, detention or imprisonment to spy on dissenters and return migrants to China. Last month, the American Chang Li Association welcomed Mayor Adams as an honored guest at its gala. Though the mayor did not disclose his participation at the event on his official agenda. Photos published on a Queens-based Chinese-language news service post revealed Adams' presence there. At the dinner, Adams made a speech honoring the America Chang Li Association, calling it an important and powerful social organization that makes great contributions to New York City. Others in attendance included Senator John Liu, City Council Member Sandra Ung, and representatives from the offices of Congresswoman Grace Meng and City Council Member Christopher Mart. At least two members of the NYPD were also seen in the photos. British members of parliament have called for an investigation following reports of unofficial Chinese police stations operating in the UK. The security minister, Tom Tugendhat, said the government will step up its work to prevent transnational repression. The overseas stations say they provide administrative support, like renewing Chinese driver's licenses. But investigations found they are being used to force dissidents to go back to China. Here's Alicia Kearns, chair of the Foreign Affairs Committee, raising the issue in parliament. There are troubling reports, Madam Deputy Speaker, of a widespread network of Chinese police stations operating worldwide, including three in our own country, Croydon, Hendon and Glasgow. Now, publicly, these stations are harmless administrative centres for Chinese nationals, but reports suggest that actually, in fact, they are used to hunt down dissidents and alleged Chinese criminals. Now, the Chinese government has admitted their existence, and so my question to the Minister are, what is the legal basis for their operations on UK soil? Are Chinese officials involved in the administration? Tugendhat said the Chinese overseas stations aren't exclusive to the UK and called such repressive tendencies unacceptable. He said he's working with the UK police to keep on top of the offense. The Dutch government on Tuesday ordered China to close police stations in the Netherlands immediately for good. Reports say they were used to monitor and harass Chinese dissidents. A foreign minister says that although the stations do provide consular help, they do not have permission for that. He says that alone is enough to shut them down. Meanwhile, the ministry will take a deeper look at such activity. It will also reach out to other EU countries where sources say Chinese police stations are located. The reports came in the wake of a September investigation by Spain-based NGO Safeguard Defenders. It claims that China has 54 overseas police centers around the world, including the two in the Netherlands. It also said there were three in the UK and one in New York City. The European Union's industry chief says that European governments and companies must realize that China is a rival to the EU and they should not be naive when approving Chinese investment. 
European Commissioner Thierry Benton said we need to be extremely vigilant. Benton said the EU adopted a series of measures to block Chinese investment in critical infrastructure since the EU labeled China a systemic rival in 2019. He said it's now up to the member states to use them. His comments appear to be aimed at, in part, at Germany, whose Chancellor Olaf Scholz will visit Beijing on Friday. Germany recently decided to approve the sale of a stake in the country's largest port in Hamburg to a Chinese state-run company baffling many diplomats. Chancellor Scholz was in favor of the sale despite strong pushback from his governing coalition partners. Scholz's visit to Beijing will be the first by an EU leader since the start of the COVID-19 pandemic. North Korea fired at least 17 missiles into the sea today. Seoul says one of them landed less than 38 miles off South Korea's coast and for the first time crossed a disputed maritime border, which is outside of South Korea's territorial waters. The apparent missile tests triggered air raid signals on the South Korean island of Oolong. South Korean President Yoon suk yeol called it an effective act of territorial encroachment. Military chiefs in Seoul voiced alarm at the latest development. This North Korean missile launch, which marks the first time since the division of the peninsula that has landed near our territorial waters south of the northern limit line, is very rare and we can never tolerate it. Our military will firmly respond to it. In response, South Korea scrambled fighter jets that fired three air-to-ground missiles across the maritime border. Japan also condemned Pyongyang's missile tests. Its defense chief said a complaint was lodged with Beijing through diplomatic channels. Wednesday's launch comes after a warning from Pyongyang of powerful follow-up measures if the U.S. and South Korea didn't stop large-scale joint air drills. Those went ahead with hundreds of warplanes, including F-35 stealth fighters from both sides, staging mock attacks 24 hours a day. According to Seoul, the training was needed to counter potential threats from North Korea, which has staged a record number of missile launches this year. In a statement, North Korea said the Allied drills were, quote, inordinate moves for military confrontation that created a grave situation on the Korean peninsula. A South Korean pub owner talks about what he saw the night of the deadly crowd crush in Seoul. It left 154 people dead and 149 injured. And just a warning, the following scenes might be disturbing for some viewers. On the night of the deadly crush in Seoul, South Korea, Park Kun Ho was on his rooftop bar. The pub he owns overlooks a narrow alley in the Itaewon district. I was working behind the counter, he says. He recalled looking outside from time to time since opening the bar at 5.30 p.m. on Saturday. Tens of thousands of young people had flocked to the area for the first virtually unrestricted Halloween festivities in three years. Park says at first he was excited to have so many customers. Then he captured this video at 9.55 p.m. and shows people flooding the streets. And shortly after, at 10.20 p.m., chaos erupted. The crowd poured into one particularly narrow and sloping alley that was already packed wall to wall. Social media footage showed people squeezing into the streets for several blocks surrounding the alley where many of the deaths would occur. Witnesses say when those at the top of the slope fell, it sent people below toppling over others. The result was a crush that killed at least 154 people and injured 149. Park directed his staff to keep customers inside and ran down to the scene. He performed CPR and managed to save one woman's life. There were dead bodies all lined up along here, he says. Over here, we perform CPR and then send people on their way. Roughly 100,000 people were estimated to be in Itaewon on Saturday. But according to the city of Seoul, there were only 137 police officers in the district at the time. Officials are still investigating the cause of the crush. Safety experts say proper traffic control could have prevented or at least reduced the surge that led to the disaster. If you have any news tips or feedback for the show, don't hesitate to email us at news.today at ntd.com. 
And just ahead, U.S. military inspectors are tracking weapons donated to Ukraine that follows rumors that the equipment might be spreading to the black market. And Benjamin Netanyahu is on track to make a comeback as Israel's prime minister. Exit polls are out from the parliamentary election on Tuesday. We'll have all that and more for you in just a minute. Rumors are circulating that U.S. arms donations to Ukraine may have spread to the black market. The Pentagon says it has sent military officers for inspections in Ukraine. The U.S. has supplied billions of dollars in defense equipment to Ukraine since Russia's invasion. But now there's speculation about these weapons circulating illegally. In response, the Biden administration has planned closer monitoring of the aid. The inspectors now in Ukraine are part of the U.S. military. Defense officials say they have seen no evidence that the weapons were lost to the black market, but fears linger about Russia's ability to capture U.S. weapon systems. The Pentagon says it will stay alert to the risk and is working to prevent it. Wealthy Russian businessman Oleg Tinkoff has renounced his Russian citizenship in protest over the war in Ukraine. He is believed to live in London and has been an outspoken critic of the invasion and President Vladimir Putin. The 54-year-old founder of Tinkoff Bank was worth over $9.5 billion at his peak. He also said he was suing the bank to force it to stop using his name, saying, My name should not be associated with fascism. His upstart digital credit card company, TCS, grew to become one of Russia's largest financial institutions. Leaders from nearly 40 countries vowed to work together to track down hackers behind ransomware attacks. They also pledged not to grant ransomware criminals safe haven and committed to other countermeasures to prevent the attacks. The government leaders met in Washington, D.C. for the counter-ransomware initiative on Tuesday. Ransomware attacks impact thousands of companies and individuals every year globally. A recent spy cloud survey found that 90% of organizations reported being affected by ransomware in the last 12 months. Research by Chainalysis found that roughly 74% of ransomware revenue in 2021 went to individuals who were highly likely to be affiliated with Russia. Now turning our attention to Denmark, results from the nation's general election are out. The left-leaning bloc was able to maintain a slim majority in parliament. The election took place on Tuesday. Prime Minister Matt Fredriksen, Social Democratic Party, is again the biggest in parliament, with 27% of the votes. This was the party's best election performance in more than two decades. The left-leaning bloc got, in total, 87 seats in the 179-seat parliament. But despite the win, the prime minister said she would resign and try to form a new government with broader support across the political divide. The left-leaning parties that could ally to form a new government include the Socialist People's Party, the Red-Green Alliance, and the Social Liberal Party. The opposition Liberal Party acknowledged defeat. They lost 19 of their 43 seats in parliament. In the UK, former Health Secretary Matt Hancock has been suspended as a, as a Conservative Party politician, but will continue as an independent. That's after signing up to join the reality TV show, I'm a Celebrity, Get Me Out of Here. Hancock was a surprise extra name added to the list of contenders, and allies said he would use his appearance to promote his work on dyslexia. But it will mean being away from Parliament, and the Conservative Party withdrew the whip, meaning he was effectively suspended from the party. The West Suffolk MP was forced to quit as Health Secretary in June 2021 after breaking lockdown rules by having an affair with an aide in his ministerial office. And now over to Israel. Former Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu is on track to return to power. This is according to exit polls from the country's parliamentary election on Tuesday. Exit polls predict that Netanyahu's right-wing coalition would gain a slim majority in parliament, or 62 out of 120 seats. This would pave the way for Netanyahu's comeback. Incumbent Prime Minister Yair Lapid's coalition is expected to take 53 or 54 seats, but the official result is not expected until later in the week. Lapid stopped short at conceding defeat and said he would wait until the final count was in. Netanyahu celebrated today, saying, quote, We have won a huge vote of confidence from the people of Israel. We are on the brink of a very big victory. This was Israel's fifth parliamentary election in less than four years, but voter turnout was at the highest levels since 1999. 
And over in Ecuador, at least five police officers were killed in explosive attacks leading to a state of emergency in two provinces yesterday. The attacks were in response to prisoner transfers from overcrowded and violent prisons. Ecuador's president has repeatedly said the violence comes from gang retaliation for his government's efforts to combat the drug trade. Ecuador is a transit point for drugs destined for the United States and Europe. The president says the attacks were an open declaration of war by gangs. He has repeatedly used emergency declarations to try to counter violence. Seven prison officers were also taken hostage by inmates in protest of prisoner transfers. The officers were released after negotiations. Jail violence in Ecuador has soared since late 2020, killing at least 400 people. And still to come, a tiny endangered fish in Tennessee is waiting for a new home. Finding a habitat is make or break for their future survival. And for endangered whales, a smart device is helping them hear the ocean. It protects them from colliding with ships as they migrate. Stay tuned for more on that when we return. Welcome to RenBiz.com, the education and career program where parents rule. We replace public schools and universities. We are for ages 6 to 100. Never any big student loans with us. You graduate with a traditional diploma, a university degree, and your own family business. Adults returning to obtain better careers. Parents looking for better academic and career opportunities for their kids. At Business Acation, you spend 50% of your time on traditional education and 50% on business education, including setting up your own family business. Learning is in your small in-person pods of 6 to 10 students. At Renaissance Business Acation, aka RenBiz.com, graduation means you have a degree and your own family business. Like education always should have been, a transition to getting a career. Tennessee's endangered Barron's top minnows are under U.S. federal protection, but officials haven't said where. The establishment of its critical habitat remains up in the air, leaving the future of the tiny fish in doubt. For about 40 years, the attractive Barron's top minnows were on the verge of extinction until they officially entered the endangered species list in 2019. But since then, they've been caught in another bind. It's like Noah's Ark. They, uh, we have them here holding them because the um, original place where they were found, it's now, now a hostile environment with those mosquito fish and they can't survive. These four inch minnows are named for where they live, the Barrens Plateau in Tennessee. The waters there are isolated by small waterfalls and cascades, preventing downstream fish from invading their territory. But sometime in the 1960s or 70s, the Western mosquito fish was introduced for mosquito control they became a major competitor and predator of Barron's top minnows. Everywhere the mosquito fish was introduced, the top minnows disappeared. Every time you lose a species out of an ecosystem, that ecosystem gets a little weaker. Now it's not cleaning your water as much. So pretty soon you gotta pay more for drinking water. You can't swim in the rivers and you can't eat the fish that you catch. So just trying to keep all these cool critters in Tennessee alive helps us as well as all these critters. Efforts have been made to rescue the rare species. It's to recognize predators that aren't native, like mosquito fish, um, and then they restock them and they had very little recapture, but they did get a few of them that they had trained and none that they hadn't trained. So maybe there's something crazy like that, training fishes to recognize predators. Recently, the Center for Biological Diversity threatened to sue the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service for its delay in defining a critical habitat for the tiny fish. The service has asked for patience, saying they will take action by the end of the year. A device that can hear the ocean could help endangered whales avoid colliding with ships while migrating from Antarctica to the equator. Migrating whales rely on sounds like these to help navigate and hunt. 
These high-tech smart boys being installed off the coast of Chile will have one main job, to listen to the whales and, using artificial intelligence, help them avoid colliding with ships while migrating from Antarctica to the equator. This boy is the first of many planned in the Gulf of Corcovado, some 680 miles south of Chile's capital. The area, full of fjords and islands, is teeming with marine life and has a large number of blue whales, as well as Say and France whales during certain seasons. But the area also faces lots of marine traffic that produces sound pollution that threatens the whales. The technology we are installing now with the Blue Boat Initiative will allow us to monitor the oceans, that is to listen to everything that happens underwater and once we detect whales, we will be able to warn ships of their presence in real time and thus avoid collisions. The boy works by using software called Listening to the Deep Ocean Environment, or LIDO. It monitors sounds and uses AI to identify sea mammals and their location in real time. It then alerts nearby vessels so they can reduce noise and avoid collisions. The initiative is the result of nearly a decade of studies and development supported by Chile's Environment Ministry. The plan is to cover the Gulf with a minimum of six buoys and eventually the entire migratory route of the whales from Antarctica to the equator. The U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service took an important step in protecting emperor penguins this week. On Tuesday, the tallest and heaviest of penguins were officially placed under the safekeeping of the Endangered Species Act. The species is now categorized as threatened. Having an endangered species classification could help the emperor penguin population just as it helped stabilize the population of polar bears. And just ahead, forests are alive with a variety of mushrooms of different colors and sizes. Fall rains have brought a large bounty for mushroom pickers in France and Switzerland. Details to come on NTD News Today. Fall rains bring a bumper crop of mushrooms in France and Switzerland. There's a variety of fungi rich for picking, but some are poisonous, so amateur pickers are sure to double-check with experts. And today's Andrew Thomas has the details. After a long, dry summer, heavy rains are restoring mushroom growth. In France and Switzerland, mushroom pickers forage in the woods for their favorite fungi. The forest grounds are alive with a variety of mushrooms of different colors and sizes. Last summer we found many mushrooms in July and August. But this year it was so hot during summer we didn't find anything. But now everything is coming out at once. Her basket mainly contains a mushroom commonly called a fleecy milk cap. She also found one penny bun, a gem among edible mushrooms. Local Frenchman Francois Ducre has been picking mushrooms for 40 years. Today, he has come across some interesting and rare species. An oyster mushroom growing on a dead tree trunk is a special find. You need to have good eyesight, and it helps to know the tree species because mushrooms often grow in symbiosis with trees. The Goliath webcap is one of the only edible species from a large family of mainly toxic mushrooms. It's strongly discouraged for non-experts to try to eat this type. In the last three weeks to a month, we have regularly had people come to our counter in the evening to have mushrooms checked. Safer and more common favorites are the hedgehog mushroom and the black chanterelle. Mushrooms that were supposed to come up during spring or summer didn't grow. But we can find them now thanks to this humidity that allowed the root structure to wake up. And now we're finding mushrooms that theoretically shouldn't be here. Mushroom pickers meet randomly in the woods and discuss their finds. Some of them are on a mission to expand their knowledge of edible mushrooms. We did well to come here because most of what I picked today was not edible. It's a shame, but it's good to have come here and not ended up eating a non-edible mushroom. In the Geneva area, mushroom pickers are allowed to pick four pounds of fungi. Across the border in France, pickers are allowed up to 11 pounds. Andrew Thomas, NTD News. An extremely rare first edition copy of the U.S. Constitution will go up for auction next month. 
Sotheby's Auction House says it is expecting bids up to $30 million for the document. Printed ahead of the Constitutional Convention in 1787, Sotheby's says only 13 of the originals are known to exist. Last year, another privately held copy was put up for auction and fetched a record $43.2 million. Billionaire hedge fund manager Ken Griffin was the winning bidder. He has since loaned the document to an art museum in Arkansas. Sotheby's says that sale was the most watched auction in the company's history. It's hoping for a similar response with this auction. And another historical document has recently surfaced. Researchers have discovered what is believed to be the oldest map of the stars. Archivists uncovered the long-lost historical relic hidden underneath a Christian manuscript. That's according to the Museum of the Bible, which identified the map as belonging to the ancient astronomer Hipparchus, who was considered to be the father of trigonometry. The more than 2,000-year-old map was discovered on a piece of reused parchment using a multispectral imaging. You can find more information about the map's discovery in the Journal for the History of Astronomy. There's usually a lot of controversy surrounding diets, but it is sure makes sense that the healthier it is, the longer you will live. Here's Gina Marie with Strong Mind and Body. Studies confirm that eating a healthy diet can lengthen your life. It can reduce cardiovascular disease, diabetes, and even cancer. It's estimated globally that there's around 11 million deaths arising each year from poor diets. Researchers in Norway pulled data from various studies and came up with a tool showing how diet can add to life expectancy. The typical Western diet is usually high in prepackaged foods, refined grains, seed oils, red meat, processed meat, high sugar drinks, and sweets. The sooner the dietary change was made, the better, and the switch has to be permanent. So make the change now and don't delay. Here's some examples. If a person at 20 years old switches to an optimal diet rich in fruits, vegetables, whole grains, nuts, legumes, and fish, he can expect a long life. The largest gains in life expectancy were linked to these foods. Making the change to an optimal diet at age 60 added 8 years for women and 9 years for men. If you are 80 when you switch diet, the gains dropped to 3 years for both men and women. When this study was released, it confirmed long-standing recommendations from the 2020 Dietary Guidelines for Americans the American Cancer Society, the American Diabetes Association, and the World Health Organization. But what about physical activity? The above study only considered diet. The British medical journal The Lancet recently evaluated 15 studies from Asia, Australia, Europe, and North America. They looked at the number of steps people took per day to examine the connection to illness and death. Their summary, food and activity are two sides of the same coin. Combine an optimal diet with 10,000 steps per day to enjoy a longer, healthy life. A rare ball from Argentine soccer star Diego Maradona is going up for auction. This little ball completed the greatest goal in one of the most famous World Cup matches in history. The ball is from the 1986 World Cup quarterfinal between Argentina and England. Maradona hit the ball into the net six minutes into the second half. He said afterwards that the goal was aided by the hand of God. Four minutes later, he dribbled in from his own half to score a second goal, widely considered the greatest goal in World Cup history. The ball is being sold by the referee who officiated that match. The auction will be hosted by auctioneer Graham Budd on November 16th. Budd calls it a historic ball and expects it to fetch close to $3 million at auction. Bidders can now register and bid from online. That's all for today's program. We're really glad to have you with us. Please send us an email if you'd like to tell us something. We're going to put it on screen. For podcasters, that's news.today at ntd.com. I'm Kevin Hogan, NTD News, New York City.
Hello, I'm Mike Lindell, and in light of the recent events, your continued support means everything to myself and my employees. To thank you, we're having the biggest sale ever on all my pillow bedding. Get my pillow bed sheets for as low as $29.98, a set of pillowcases for only $9.98. In this economy, instead. Thanks for watching us on YouTube. Did you know YouTube only keeps selective videos on its platform? So if you want to make sure you get the full picture, just subscribe to our newsletter. Go to newsletter.ntd.com and sign up. It's free.